John stepped out of the cab. It had been a long flight into Boston, and the drive to the hotel felt even longer. Boston was a messy city. The roads looked like a spider had been given a lobotomy, then injected with heroin and asked to spin a web from memory. None of the roads made sense, nothing was laid out in even remotely orderly fashion, intersections were a mess, far too many roads were one way, and no road went in a straight line for more than a couple of blocks. Even if the roads hadn't been atrocious, the sheer volume of traffic left every lane congested. If you needed to change lanes for any reason, you were guaranteed to cut someone off in the process, and to make matters worse, most people walked in the city. John couldn't blame them. Property was expensive in Boston, and just storing a car would have cost a small fortune. If you could afford somewhere to park, then you'd have to spend your time battling traffic, adding an extra hour to any trip. The obvious solution was to walk, and call a cab when necessary. The only problem with that plan was that the only way for a pedestrian to get around the city was to jaywalk, which they did without a second thought. It wasn't as if there were no crosswalks either. Probably a third of the lights in the city were so that pedestrians could safely cross some road or another, but the lights took too long, and it was far easier, and in many cases safer, to cross the road wherever there was a break in traffic. All of this led to John's cab ride from Logan International Airport to his hotel in Salem, taking a full 30 minutes longer than necessary. Along the way, they nearly hit four pedestrians and three cars, and the cab driver ran seven red lights. Finally, after an hour and a half, John arrived at the Conant Inn. He was tired after a long flight from L.A., and he could feel sleep calling him, but he had work to do first. John shook himself, paid the driver, grabbed a suitcase, and walked up the steps to the inn. It was a brick building, with arches over all the windows, made out of white plaster. There were green shutters over all the windows, as well as on each of the cardinal points of the bell tower on top of the inn. The bell tower itself was off-center, resting on the right side of the building instead. Inside of the bell tower was a shining brass bell. In addition to the bell tower, each room had a corresponding chimney over the roof, as well as dormers for each of the top rooms that seemed to jut out from the sides of the inn. There was a small rectangular balcony over the front door, supported by white columns with marble steps. In front of the whitewashed oak doors was a black iron knocker held in the mouth of a lion. John stepped out of the brisk November air into the lobby. The floor was made out of smooth oak boards that had been darkened with age. There were spots that looked as if they had been burned, but overall they looked to be in pretty good shape. The floor was covered by a thick green rug and white wooden tables with dark stained tabletops. The edges of the room were made out of molded plaster. The mantle over the fireplace was also made out of oak, and it had several pieces of fine china resting on top of it. Around the fireplace was more molded plaster, and the floor near the fireplace was made out of brick. It had a glass door in front of it to keep the embers inside. Next to the fireplace were a few armchairs and some end tables with various magazines displayed for the patrons. The fireplace did have a log burning inside, and John grabbed a black iron poker to help stir the embers slightly, but it did little to heat the lobby. He shivered slightly, hoping his room had better heating. All of the lights had brass features, except for the chandelier, which looked to be made out of silver. It was a beautiful building, but John still would have preferred a modern hotel. He stepped up to the front desk to greet a man in tan slacks with a white dress shirt and a red vest. John figured he felt cold too, because he was wearing a thick wool jacket over his vest. He had zipped it up as much as he could while still showing his name tag. It read Albert in cursive. Albert was a short, fat man with a bald spot on his crown. He had a thick, oiled handlebar mustache. His black hair was combed neatly, and he had a pair of spectacles that gave him a very intelligent, respectable sort of look. John set down his suitcase as he began to sign into the room, talking idly with Albert to pass the time. Is it always this busy here? John asked sarcastically. Albert shifted uncomfortably. Oh, well, uh, he said, looking down at his computer. November is one of our less busy months, especially this year, so we send most of our staff home until a few days into December. We only have three staff members here at the moment. John raised his eyebrow. What do you mean this year? he asked. Oh, it's just a local superstition. Salem is full of them, you know. I hadn't noticed, John said, still suspicious of the man. He seemed honest enough, but it still felt like he was hiding something. Oh, well, uh, maybe the younger generation isn't so superstitious, he said nervously. Seeing the look on John's face, he added quickly, But at this point, it's become tradition. Besides, I assure you that no matter what needs you might have, we are more than capable of meeting them, even with our uh, limited staff. John finished signing a piece of paper and handed it to Albert. I'm sure, he said dryly. Albert reached down and grabbed his room key. You have the Southern Suite. It has a lovely view of Highland Park. He handed the keys to John, but he hesitated at the last second. You know, Mr. Morrison, it can get very cold here this time of year. Are you sure you wouldn't prefer another hotel? I have friends that are nearby, and I can transfer your reservations, and... 
John snatched the keys from Alvar's hand and cut him short. My editors want a piece on this inn. Besides, I'm sure the gold will be fine. After all, you're more than capable of meeting my needs. Albert's eyes got big as he began to stammer, Of course, of course, it's just... Just what? John asked. I swear, it's almost as if you don't want guests. Of course not. We hope you enjoy your stay here, Albert said. He let John go, but he still looked nervous about something. John was about to go to his room when Albert spoke again. Oh, Mr. Morrison, be sure to lock your room after dark. John stopped and looked at him strangely. And why would I need to do that? Albert shifted nervously. We, uh he said, as if weighing each word carefully. We seem to have found ourselves in a bit of a rougher neighborhood as of late. I just recommend for your safety that you lock your door and not open it until the morning. I'll keep that in mind, John said, and he left the nervous man as he ascended the stairs up towards his room. John fumbled for the key to his room. He pulled it out of his pocket and looked at it. Unlike a key card from most modern hotels, it was an actual key, with an oval wooden tag attached to it that read Conant Inn on one side and Room 407 on the other. He grabbed the key and slid it into the lock, opening the door to his room. He was in the corner, facing towards the east. It was a nice enough room, with a brick fireplace and plaster molding, oak floors, white wooden walls, and a high ceiling. Next to the fireplace was an armchair and an end table with a lantern on it. His bed was somewhat small, but it was ornately carved, and it had smooth, dark green linen sheets. Next to the bed was a nightstand, with a wind-up analog clock, a telephone, and a small lamp. And in the corner of the room was a large wardrobe. There was no TV, but there was a large selection of books underneath the end table. John set down his suitcase next to his bed and unpacked his clothes for the evening. The room was cold, but there was a tinderbox and a few logs. He made a small fire and let it burn while he stepped into the bathroom. He figured that if heating was an issue, then it was worth seeing if they had hot water. The bathroom itself was small, with white and gold tiling and brass fixtures. It was clean, though, and well-stocked, and to John's relief, there was hot water. He splashed some in his face and dried off with a hand towel, before stepping back out into his room. It was cold, but unlike the lobby, the fireplace was starting to warm the room. He shivered and pulled his jacket tight around himself, before tossing another log on the fire. He decided to order some dinner before writing his article. He wanted to test just how well the inn could manage, despite being short-staffed. He placed an order with the hotel kitchen, and to his surprise, they informed him that they would have it ready within half an hour. He settled into his armchair and pulled out his tablet to do some research while he waited. He signed into the inn's Wi-Fi and started reading up on the history of the building. He had fallen asleep out of boredom when he heard a knock on the door. He glanced at the time on his tablet. It was 9 o'clock, exactly 27 minutes after he had placed his order for his dinner. He opened the door to see a tall, dark-skinned man with high eyebrows and a receding hairline. He had a narrow face to match his narrow frame, and he was dressed in the same uniform as Albert, though without any jacket. John thanked him and tipped him for the meal. He took the meal and set it down on the end table. It was steaming hot beef tips with garlic mashed potatoes, asparagus, and a side of clam chowder. He feasted on it hungrily, letting the meal warm him up. After he was done, he called for room service to take away his dirty dishes, and he began to write his article. An hour and a half came and went before he finally gave up. He couldn't focus on it, and no matter how hard he tried to write, the words just wouldn't come to him. The only cure for writer's block that John knew of was a stiff drink and a good night's sleep. There was only one thing for it. He was off to the bar. The bar itself was nice enough. It looked like the rest of the hotel, but three of the four walls were made out of brick, and the wall on his right was lined with wooden barrels. He wondered if they actually had any alcohol or if they were just for show. He figured they were probably for show, but his mouth watered at the thought of aged bourbon in an oak barrel. The room was dimly lit, except for the bar itself. The only people in the room were him and the bartender. He was dressed in the same clothes as the housekeeper and Albert from the front desk, except his vest was green with golden quilted patterns. The bartender was a man of average height, well-muscled, but with a bit of a beer gut, and he had shoulder-length brown hair and a thick beard. He seemed friendly enough, but he looked bored. The man took a sip of his own drink and waved at John. I didn't realize you could drink on the job, John said. The bartender gestured to an empty room. Do I look busy to you? John chuckled. I guess not. You better believe it, he said. You're the first guy to step in here all night. Really? he asked. Yes, sir, he said. Now what can I get you? John shrugged. Whatever you're having, I guess. The bartender filled a pint of hard cider and passed it to John. So what's your name, he asked, taking a seat on the other side of the bar. John, he said, introducing himself. I'm from L.A., here to write an article about the inn. What about you? L.A.? That's a long flight. 
My sister lives out there, and she complains about it every time she comes back for Christmas. I'm Bill, he said, extending a hand. Nice to meet you, Bill, John said. Do you mind answering some questions for me? Born and raised here? Yes, I'm single. Eight years and thighs, he said, not waiting for the questions. Oh, and yes, I take tips. John raised his eyebrows again. What? he asked. Oh, I just give the usual answer to what people ask around here. John shook his head. Good for you, he said. But that's not what I meant. Well, what do you want to know, he said, leaning on his elbow. Well, John said, rubbing his chin, let's start with why this place is so empty. Because Albert is superstitious about some old folktale. What old folktale, John asked. Don't tell me you believe in that sort of thing, Bill said. Not at all, John said, dismissively. It's just that sort of thing sells papers. Bill rolled his eyes, but he indulged John. Oh, well, there's not much to it. The basic story is that around this time of year, right after the witch trials, one of the people who had been hanged came back from the grave and started attacking the settlers. They burned the body and buried him somewhere underneath where the inn is now. So Albert thinks the inn is haunted, John asked. Oh, no, Bill said, shaking his head. It's not a ghost. It's a vampire. Uh, vampire? John asked skeptically. Oh, yeah, that's how the story goes at any rate. Some people say one of the surviving witches cast a spell to bring him back. Others say he cursed the town and swore vengeance. The only consistent part of the story is that the vampire would come back and feed on the blood of the settlers until they killed him again. And after they built the inn, he'd come back every ten years and feed again. What a load of crap, John said. I agree, Bill said, passing John another pint, which he accepted gratefully. It's the sort of thing they designed to sell t-shirts. Do they say who the vampire is supposed to be? John asked. Only nineteen of the accused witches were hanged, four died in prison, and one old guy was crushed to death. Since only like five or six of them were men, it's not like there are a lot of options. Oh, that bit of information is conveniently missing, Bill said. Of course, John said, rolling his eyes. And Albert is trying to shut down the inn because of that. Bill grinned. Hey, I'm not complaining. He pays me enough to make up for it, and I get to have a nice drink during my shift. Cheers to that, John said, clinking his glass with Bill's. What I don't get is why he doesn't shut down the place if he's so worried about it. I mean, he practically tried to run me out of the door when I checked in. Well, technically, it's a historic site owned by the city, so he can't shut it down without permission. He just has to count himself lucky that they don't try and capitalize on the tourism. I guess that makes sense, John said, downing his second glass of hard cider. I still think it's a load of crap. You still have the bar open, though. Bill grinned. I'll drink to that, he said, sliding another pint over to John. John stumbled down the hall to his room. He and Bill had stayed up till one o'clock drinking. Between the two of them, they had gone through three plates of wings and eight pints of hard cider. After drinking the lion's share, John had tried to ask for another pint, but his words came out slurred. Despite his semi-intelligible protestation, Bill sent John back to his room to sleep it off. John complained like a toddler being put in time out, but he went. After tripping on the stairs four times and getting lost twice, John finally had to admit that Bill was right. As he fumbled for the key to his room, his mind drifted to their conversation about the inn's vampire. Come out every ten years, John slurred, fighting hiccups. I'll show... I'll show... I'll show them. John found the keyhole and forced the key into the lock. He slammed into the door, opening it at the same time. He hadn't expected the door to swing open so quickly, and he stumbled, barely managing to keep himself from falling by catching the doorknob. He raised his voice and yelled down the hall. There aren't any vampires, he said, trailing off. Vampires. Vampires. <laughs> he chuckled as he entered his room and closed the door behind him. He kicked off his shoes and fell on the bed, almost passing out. He stayed that way for a long time. He had lost track of how long he had been in his stupor when he heard a loud crashing sound down the hallway. He felt groggy, but he lifted his head from the sheets, walking over to the door and poking his head out. Quiet down, John said. I'm trying to sleep here. You want to wake the dead? John looked in the direction of the crash. In the pale moonlight, he could even see what looked like a man. He was tall, taller by far than he had any right to be. Even haunched over, he looked almost six and a half feet tall. He had large, hairy hands and long nails, and his ears were pointed. He looked almost human, but his eyes were too big, and they were sunken in his skull. His skin was dark and pale, and his hair was long and stringy. His head was long and narrow, and his nose looked almost like it wasn't even there. Worst of all, he looked familiar to John. He was dressed in a pair of tan slacks and a white dress shirt with a red vest. John's eyes got big as he realized who it was. 
He slammed the door and locked it behind him, just as the housekeeper started running down the hall towards him. John sunk to the floor with a sigh of relief, but as soon as he hit the floor, he heard a squeaking metallic noise. He looked up in horror to see the lock was undoing itself. In sheer terror, he grabbed the armchair and wedged it under the door handle. The vampire tried turning the handle, but it wouldn't budge. After several long moments, it stopped, and John let out a sigh of relief. He tried turning on the lights, but nothing happened. With a shiver, he walked over and fumbled in the dark for matches in the tinderbox. He lit the lantern and let out a sigh of relief. It was all a nightmare. It was just some bad dream. He would wake up from it at any moment. His drunken mind was playing tricks on him. That must have been it. The housekeeper was out in the hallway, and his drunken mind was stuck on the vampire story, and it was just playing some trick on him. He laughed nervously and walked over to the nightstand, picking up the phone to call the lobby and apologize for yelling at the housekeeper. When he put the phone to his ear, though, all he heard was a dead line. He tried dialing for the front desk, but the phone just continued its dead hum. He set it down in the cradle and shivered in horror. He tried flipping on the lamp, but nothing happened. He rummaged desperately in his bag for his tablet and phone, but both of them were dead. His eyes opened wide with horror, and he dropped them both. He was frozen like that for a long moment before he finally shook himself out of his paralysis. Drunk or not, something was wrong. He hastily put all the logs on the fire and put everything from the tinderbox inside the fireplace, including most of the matches. He struck one of the remaining matches and lit the fire, and before long the fire was blazing brightly, lighting up the whole room with a warm glow. It made him feel more comfortable, and he sat on the floor next to the fireplace, with a blanket wrapped around his torso and his knees drawn up to his chest. He sat like that for hours, drifting in and out of consciousness. He woke up several times, yelling with fright, but there was never anything nearby. He slept fitfully for that few hours, and each time he woke he would screw up his eyes and pray it was dawn. Finally, the door handle began to turn again, and he cowered under his blanket in fright. The door was jammed closed and nothing could get in, but it didn't matter. John was awake now, and he would not be going back to sleep. He knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he wasn't drunk, and his mind wasn't playing tricks on him. There was a vampire outside his room, and he chastised himself for not heeding Albert's warning. If only he had listened! He could have been across town in a different inn or hotel, or even out on the streets. It would have been better than being trapped in his room. He didn't know what time it was, or when dawn would come. He could only hope that it came soon. He watched the door attentively, keeping an eye out for any sign that the door might open. It was dimmer in the room now. His logs had burned down and only gave off a faint glow, and his candle was almost gone. He whimpered softly in the dark and tried not to think about what would happen when the candle went out. John tried counting the seconds, but no matter how fast he counted, the time seemed to move by at a snail's pace. He almost fell asleep again when he heard a rasping sound at the window. His head jerked up and snapped over to see what was at the window. He cried out in horror when he saw it. The hand! That same hairy hand! It was at the window. It didn't look like it was connected to a body. Instead, it was just floating there. It traced out a pattern, scoring the glass pane. Slowly, it drew, as if trying to avoid making any mistakes. It drew one, then another, and another, until a five-pointed star was cut into the window. Then the hand began its next step, as it traced a circle connecting each of the five points. John saw a pentagram by the dim light of his candle. He screamed in horror, but the hand continued. It touched the window softly, and the window began to open. As soon as there was a gap big enough to let in air, a large gust of cold wind blew into the room. The candle went out, and the last embers in the fireplace died, tossing the room into total darkness. John scrambled for the lantern and the matches, and he leapt to his feet. He backed into the corner of the room and tried desperately to relight the candle. One by one, all his matches burned and went out until finally, on the second-to-last match, the candle caught. It cast enough of a glow for John to see the creature. At first it was just the hand that was in the room with him, but slowly the vampire appeared, as if it was standing behind a screen and slowly stepping out. And then there it was, standing right in front of him. It gave him one wicked grin and pinched the wick of the candle. In the total darkness, John let out one last bone-chilling scream. <laughs>